Welcome everyone. My name is Christina Carlos. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis. Um, I'm sure you've seen my face if you've been popping in and out of the sessions. Uh, and I'm going to be moderating a discussion on Hypothesis in the English classroom, annotation to extend student reading and writing skills. So joining us today, we have in no particular order, uh, Kurt Nering Bliss from SUNY Finger Lakes Community College. Diana Applebaum from Marymount Manhattan College. Um, so we have New York City and New York State represented, and then Jennifer Joswiak from California joining. Um, so at Allen Hancock College. So thanks all for joining today. And I will stop my screen share so we can get chatting. Um, so just to start us off, I know we're all joining as English faculty, but I would like to get like a little bit more context about what you teach, um, you know, what kinds of levels of students you're teaching, and just kind of a brief summary of how you tend to use hypothesis in your courses. Um, do you mind kicking us off from the West Coast, Jennifer? No, not at all. Um, so at my school, we, um, like in all the California community colleges, we have changed our requirements for freshman comps. So we no longer have developmental education and um, that's all moved to our ESL program. So if you graduate from high school in California, you need to take freshman comp, which is, um, as you know, a, a transfer level course. So here where, where I'm at, we are serving a rural community. Um, we're a Hispanic serving institution with a lot of um, first generation kids and um, a lot of their parents are working in the ag uh, businesses, you know, they're, they're working in the field. And so, you know, education is really important to these students. Um, we also have uh, free tuition for um, students that graduate high school. So we have a giant outreach to our high schools right now to get these kids into our college programs. So this results in an interesting um, mix of returning students and new students from high school of um, differing language abilities. So I'm teaching freshman comp, I teach grammar, I teach a career and technical writing course in English, and I also teach a linguistics class. Um, and all of those classes are uh, transferable except the career tech and writing. Does that answer? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> um, that definitely gives a good amount of context. So I am just going to go in the order in like more of my Zoom windows are. Kurt, do you mind uh, giving us some context as well from um, from your courses? Sure. I'm also uh, at a two-year institution, Finger Lakes Community College, part of the uh, SUNY system of New York. And um, it's an open access institution. So I'm, I'm dealing with uh, all range of learners. Um, I, I work mostly in gen ed courses, uh, freshman, first year composition, uh, as well as a 100 level literature survey course, but it's more focused on reading strategies than necessarily kind of literary um, theory at all. I also teach uh, first year seminars in humanities that's real focused on reading and writing in the humanities. And then um, I dabble once in a while in uh, creative writing workshop, creative nonfiction workshop, as well as uh, um, a world literature. So it's a range of uh, kind of a range of courses. And in terms of you, you asked about sort of modalities too, and I do both. I kind of at this point do it all. I do the in person. I do the in person synchronous with Zoom remote combo class with a kind of a seminar set up with kind of owl cameras. I also teach fully asynchronous online and I'm beginning to dabble in the in the high flex model where it's all three simultaneously. So it's um, finding ways of using these tools across all modalities. Okay, well, I'm exhausted listening to every, everything that Jennifer and Kurt teach and I've officially lost track. Um, Diana, can you round us off with and by that sharing my comment? This is the perfect panel. <laughs> Um, I'm at Marymount Manhattan College, which is a small creative arts college in New York City on the Upper East Side. Um, 
with some little bit of identity crisis. We've been a small liberal arts college. Now we're kind of more of a creative arts college. We have about 1500 students um, that come from all over the states. We are residential. And um, I've been directing the writing program at Marymount for seven years. So I mostly teach first year writing classes myself, um, all the levels from remedial to advanced and also supervise all of our uh, part-time adjuncts and train and mentor them. Um, but I also teach um, in the honors program and I teach a history of science course um, that's my own. Um, I teach professional writing, a course that I've also created. And we do have a prison program um, that's part of Marymount Manhattan. So I've taught in that program as well. And that's really rewarding. Um, yeah. So also a huge range of things and occasionally literature classes too. Wow, we definitely have a broad range of reading and writing classes being represented here um, and lots of different target audiences um, in your classes, it sounds like. Um, so I'm definitely interested to hear, since it sounds like a lot of you are teaching various levels of students with different experience with reading and writing, um, what do you think or how do you try to use hypothesis in order to get students to engage with reading more critically? Um, and how do you set up your readings, I guess, to do that? Um, I think I'll, I'll switch it up. Uh, Kurt, do you mind starting us off with this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I've been dabbling in hypothesis for in in context of education for five or six years now. And so I've got a slew of them, but I thought I would just focus on what I just am doing this week, actually, because it's something new and I'm kind of excited about it. I'm teaching a 100 level introduction to reading literature class. And in honor of Poetry Month, we were doing poetry and I'm particularly interested in having students collaborate on working through difficult texts. And most students do find poetry difficult. And so we we first start, we read a, a short essay by Edward Hirsch on how to read poetry. And he offers this great little uh, metaphor in it in which it, that reading poetry is like um, looking for hand climbing a rock, um, scaling a rock um, wall and looking for footholds and, and handholds in the poem and then ascending up and as we make meaning of the text. So I kind of use that metaphor to then post a poem, the poems we're working with, and we're working with a, a Nigerian poet this week and his, um, uh, Hussan Ahmed, and his poems are challenging, incredibly challenging. And so students, the first task is for students to go in and identify just a single line, a phrase or a word in which they could see it as a foothold or a handhold that something in that speaks to them in some way, and then link it to one of the reading strategies that we're working with, one of the reading lenses or some some device that they recognize. And so we just sort of, um, Hirsch also uses the term dirty the text with annotations. So we dirty the text with our marginal comments, which are just these little insights, not to the whole poem, but just to, the, to a section of it. And then collectively we read them all, and then we go back to the poem on our own. And then we we kind of bring those shared insights together. And then we go back and we we offer appreciations for whose foothold or handhold helped us deepen our understanding and meaning of the text. And um, and we kind of uh, acknowledge it in a reply to the comment. And we'll also tag our comments with what particular reading strategy or lens did we use in that sort of gripping of that foothold or handhold. And then the final move of this sequence is then to do a synthesis move in which we all then post a note, not a direct annotation, but a page note in which I use the template uh, in which is sort of a synthesis of towards interpretation. This is a poem about X and it's some theme or value or idea. And what it says about it is, and then they fill that in with their sort of statement or thesis of the poem. And then I know this because, and in the because, they actually are invited to reference what other people shared for them to help them make meaning of the text. So it's a it's real collaborative, it's sequenced, and it's really aimed at working through collaboratively uh, a difficult text and coming to some um, individual and collective understanding of a text. So that's just kind of the what I'm currently excited about because I'm just doing it this week. But that's uh, an example of how I'll um, 
I'll integrate that into a class that I'm teaching. Thanks, Kurt. That's a really great example, I think, of <clears> just <throat> knowledge co-creation and really anchoring reading strategies to the text that you're trying to get through with your students. Um, Jennifer, do you mind sharing your uh, your I guess if it, an, an example of your strategy or summary of your strategies as well. Yeah, I I honestly have not used many OER texts, so I don't do as much analysis of readings and reading instruction. Um, but where I've really embraced the use of hypothesis is with um, discussing assignments and assignment expectations. I wanted to make sure that in every class I teach, that's an online class, most of all, that um, the students are able to ask questions about assignments in a low stakes environment. So I was just I was just grading a half hour ago about the assignment requirements for a group project that I have. I'm just starting it this week for the career and technical writing, and I've just put students in groups um, related to their majors. And so, of course, everyone's freaking out about this because they've never done a group project before or they've never done a group project online. And so I want to make sure that, you know, all the assignment expectations are clear to the students. And so it's a really good time um, for them to ask questions. So I do that with all major writing assignments. Um, in the linguistics class I teach online, I do have um, the hypothesis annotation lessons supplant what we used as discussion boards in Canvas before. So I found that um, discussing the I have a dream speech um, for my sociolinguistics chapter is much more effective um, with the hypothesis annotation. Um, and one other way that I have been applying critical reading skills, I have a class that I teach online sometimes, and then often I teach it face to face, and it's the grammar class. And one of the objectives in the class is to look at proofreading and learn proofreading skills. So they are critically reading. Um, and this was an OER book for a little while, so I was able to screen capture the text. Um, but students are um, discussing the errors, correcting the errors, and doing this in a collaborative environment. So, and that's with a variety of uh, language levels in that class too. So I have, I have some professionals in their field in banking while I have um, students that are neurodivergent and ESL students and everyone's working together on this document. So it's really enlightening to me to see how they collaborate. Thanks, Jennifer. I definitely want to put a pin in those assignment instructions for our conversation later on. Um, Diana, do you mind sharing out how you primarily either primarily use hypothesis or you could give a specific example like, like Kurt did? Yeah, um, I primarily use it for texts, um, excerpts of texts, stories, um, any kind of small reading that students are doing in class. But um, I thought I would maybe zero in on a little bit the opposite of what Kurt was talking about, which I really love that really structured assignment. Um, really, primarily, I use hypothesis as a super low stakes uh, way for students to engage with the readings and to enter into discussion and collaboration. Um, I use it, I do occasionally use it with targeted, you know, like application skills, like if I want them to identify something rhetorically in the text, or if I want them to be able to find a claim, let's say in an argument text or something like that. So you, you could always target um, and have them do specific kinds of annotations. But really, I just want it to be a low stakes way for them to engage with the texts. Um, so it's very, very open ended. And I do feel like that's a important ethos in my classroom. Um, at the same time, having said that, the structure um, and and how it's set up is very structured. So in the first couple of weeks, we spent a lot of time metacognitively talking about why we annotate, how we annotate, what is annotation for, how to build the skill of annotation. And I give them lists of the kinds of annotations they could do both readerly, what I call readerly, which are like responsive annotations, and then writerly, which are more like craft-based or rhetoric-based annotations. 
Um, and so we actually practice a lot, a lot in the first couple of weeks together. So we'll take short texts and we'll stop. We'll read aloud, popcorn read, and every paragraph annotate and then discuss the annotations. Um, another real, uh, like, great way that I think, I think that the, the most transformative part of it for me has been, um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about student engagement, but um, just being able to glance at those annotations before class and really pull in those quiet students very, very early on in a class session as a kind of warm up to get them warmed up and talking. And then that really helps them participate later in the class. Um, there are lots of other ways that I use it, like for assessment, for my own self-assessment to see what readings are working and not working and that sort of thing. Um, but I do think the initial question you asked about critical skills and critical reading skills is hypothesis is really, really excellent for that because you can zero in on those skills in structured ways or very unstructured ways. Um, they can just kind of pop up and you can point to a comment that a student has made and say, look at this, you know, the way that the student has responded or notice this rhetorical element in the text. Um, yeah. Thanks, Dana. I really love because I often hear from faculty like how do, how do I use hypothesis in my class? And it's like you could come at it from so many angles and all of you have shared such different ways that you can use it in order to improve student engagement. Um, so I want to shift into thinking about how can we use these annotation assignments to support kind of the writing side of things. And, um, you know, Jennifer mentioned annotating in assignment instructions and, and Diana mentioned kind of writerly annotations. Um, so could we could we talk about that, Jennifer? How do you think annotating assignment instructions in particular has um, supported your students' formal writing skills? Well, I think I think it's been a game changer for me in a lot of regards to get those questions answered up front. It really creates that um, environment where students feel free to ask dumb questions. Um, so I, I love how much they engage and ask questions about the simplest things. I don't even care if it's the word count, but let's, let's discuss it. So anything about instructions, it really um, helps to guide um, the students writing later on. Um, one of the assignments I've been doing the last year is with the Purdue OWL online writing lab, MLA formatting. I found that this is really effective to discuss how, what MLA formatting is, examples of MLA formatting so that when they are starting to write their, their final product, their paper, um, hopefully they're much more um, likely to use, you know, this particular resource so that their formal writing meets the guidelines. Um, but I was just thinking about one other thing that I do where hypothesis is an important step. So in the career and technical writing, we did a annotation of uh, social media, how to write a social media biography. And so I start with doing the annotation on that. Then we have a discussion board where students are posting um, rough drafts and they're critiquing each other's work. And then the final assignment is due on Sunday. So three times that week, they're digesting, they're learning, they're sharing, and then they're coming up with a final product. I, I find that that's one of the most effective ways of using hypothesis as this, let's start to learn about it. And then, you know, piggybacking those other assignments um, on to the rest of the week so that it's really this, they're engaged, it's the same content, and the application is just getting um, stronger and stronger until they come up with a final product. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, it definitely offers an opportunity to scaffold those assignments for students. Um, Diana, I wanted to go back to your comments about writerly annotations and just any other thoughts you might have um, about how you use annotation to more directly support uh, student formal writing. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the most important thing is that 
hypothesis is an archive and it's a moment in time, you know, that students can keep coming back to and that you can keep coming back to and it evolves as your course evolves and as your semester evolves. So consistently reminding students that they're to go back to those readings, that they're to go back to their annotations and the annotations of their peers and to call ideas right from those annotations and to also see how their thinking has changed over the course of the semester. So that is something that we as instructors need to prompt. Um, often students are not very good at that or they've been taught, especially first year students, to see assignments as discrete, all their classes as discrete. So you know, to, to really do that kind of iterative thinking um, means to keep going back into that archive. Um, and so that I prompt that. So, you know, take three of your annotations. I'll set up a discussion board. Take three of your annotations and um, just free write or take one annotation, free write from that annotation. And then the next step will be, hey, do you see a beginning argument or claim or something in that annotation if you're teaching academic writing, for example? And they often do. Sometimes they can't identify it and we can do that together as a class or you can help them do that or they keep free writing through annotations or they jump on an idea from a classmate and that's also really fantastic. So you credit that classmate's initial idea and then you piggyback from it. Um, for longer projects and in upper level classes, my students are required to go back into hypothesis, into the texts and pull ideas from there into their final projects um, and even use those sometimes as sources, their annotations, cite their own annotations or cite the annotations of their peers in projects. I think that's a really cool way to emphasize how important that tool is to our learning and our evolution in the, in the course. So I, it's a fantastic tool for, for writing generation which is really, and, and that's really, I think actually <laughs> the really most important point that annotation is all about helping you invent and generate writing. And so the more students see that and know that and see that in practice, the more likely they are to take that from your class and annotate on their own anywhere, so. Yeah, I think um, in the prior session, Brian O'Connor was um, emphasizing he, he teaches English at Dartmouth, uh, you know, thinking as writing and, and writing as thinking and the practice of annotation, you know, helping that along. Um, so that a lot of great ideas from Diana and Jennifer in implementing annotation. Um, the half hour is going by so fast. So Kurt, I'm going to ask you to answer our next question about how, because I know you've used hypothesis in a lot of different ways. How have, how has using hypothesis changed your experience in the classroom with your students? Um, well, you know, it's that, that idea of social reading. Uh, we were seeing multiple minds, multiple perspectives, um, and we're doing it in a, a place that maybe is a little more comfortable for some learners in, a, in an asynchronous digital environment rather than the classroom. Um, one, one little thing I'll do, I teach a lot with the in-person and remote simultaneously, and it's really hard to bridge those two worlds. So we use, sometimes for that class, every reading for that discussion, we use hypothesis only to kind of like claim a passage that we're going to take responsibility to explore together. Because if I just call out in this these, these two zones of students in the room and on the screen, and I just say, so what do you think? It, it's just there's a lot of hesitancy and resistance and a lack of confidence. But um, when I can then pull up on my laptop, the hypothesis, they don't even make marginal comments other than maybe just what um, just maybe a, a couple words of what they're what uh, that might point to their thinking, and then I'll just be able to call on people, knowing they're ready to talk about this passage, and I can kind of on the spot produce the class by going through the text either in a linear fashion or relationally connecting things, and ultimately, so they've already claimed something, they're ready to talk about something, they've done some free writing on it in preparation. So the class experience when it's live has been really informed by their engagement with it and, they, and their readiness to um, to participate with with each other and ultimately it's a, just building a lot of confidence when it is when it when I use it for the 
placing of marginal comments with interpretive sorts of insights or reading for craft about what 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 the writer is doing um, that they are responding to. Um, it builds their confidence as readers. It builds their confidence as writers and thinkers. And that confidence really is such a big part at the two-year level uh, in general education is helping them recognize that they're you know they're on a level playing field with other thinkers and readers and writers and also i guess I'll, I'll i'll finally just say i use it a lot in this web showed in my first example that we're there to help each other that we're really this is not a competition this is collaboration and and we, we really are here to help and that actually i think really motivates a more authentic and um uh intrinsic kind of learning engagement with i can be a helper of somebody else through their learning process. And then you throw the metacognitive in there. Um, as Diana mentioned, it really, they, they recognize that learning has uh, a lot of components to it that, that can really impact their, their motivation. Yeah, that's great. I think students identifying as scholars and some, you know, people who are participating in the scholarly process is an important part of using hypothesis. Um, thanks for sharing that, Kurt. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, so I'm actually going to pivot. I'm going to ask Diana to answer one question and then Jennifer to answer the other question. Um, one of the questions is, uh, Diana, if you could answer this, have students ever wished anything about hypothesis would be different? Like, have you felt that your students like using hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, very rarely. Occasionally, I've had a student who said who said that they still prefer to do their annotations by hand, which is really the way that I held students accountable before the pandemic, before I was using hypothesis myself in the classes. Um, and in that case, if students do really feel like they want their annotations to be private, I remind them that they can make their annotations private in hypothesis if they want to, um, as long as they can then show me that they've engaged with the text. Um, very few, almost never have taken that, that option. Um, and I don't really see why they would considering that, you know, it's a small group, it's a community. We're all kind of like Kurt set collaborating and helping each other get through the material and understand the material. Um, but if students do want to annotate by hand, they, they can, um, and I'm not going to prevent them from doing that. Uh, but generally, yeah, my students have really, really liked the tool. Uh, they've really like a couple of people have said, and as I've been hearing all day, it really is not like discussion board at all, which is super artificial and really difficult for them to get into. And they're not in the text. They're not, you know, communicating, you know, reply to reply. Um, and it's just a really different experience. So generally, yes, my students have really, really responded well to it. Thanks, Diana, for sharing. Um, and then Jennifer, there was a, a question specifically about when you're using hypothesis for grammar. Um, the person asked, is it like the students are annotating another student's text or are they annotating like a textbook in that situation? Right. So when I use um, the annotation for proofreading, it was an OER text that I was able to download the page of and it's it's a page, it's an exercise with all sorts of proofreading errors in it. And so the students, I give the students guidelines for what I'm expecting. So I want each student to find at least three errors and I want them to explain what the errors are and how to fix them. So that means they need to understand the rules from the chapter. So this is like the very end of the chapter type of exercise. Um, and so the students are finding the errors and then they're also um, supposed to reply to at least two other students um, in this case. And so, yeah, so I'm looking for three annotations of errors, explanations of rules, and then um, replies to others. Thanks for sharing and clarifying that, Jennifer. So it looks like we actually hit the half hour. Um, that conversation went so fast and I have, as always, new ideas for annotating. Um, I just wanna thank all of our panelists again for joining. And uh, we have still one final session you can all go to if you are interested. So thanks for joining us today. And thanks to Jennifer, Kurt and Diana for a great conversation.